We're going under the hood with Dr. Sunshine, where we explore topics that are relevant to STEM professionals with intersecting identities. Thank you for listening. Hello everyone, welcome back to Under the Hood, which is an online community for aspiring current or retired STEM students and professionals. It's also a space for the friends and family of STEM people where you can hear the firsthand accounts of the behind the scenes experiences of those you care about who have dedicated their working lives to careers in STEM. So today I'm very, very excited to host Ms. Kimberly Aji in episode 11, surrounding STEM entrepreneurship. So welcome, Kim. Hi, Sonny, glad to be here. Well, it's absolutely wonderful to have you here. And I think you're really gonna bring um, a unique perspective to the platform. So just to introduce Kim, um, Kim is the president and partner of River to Tap Inc. or R2T, a full service engineering firm that provides engineering and consulting services to public and private sector clients with offices in Georgia, Florida, and Pennsylvania. RTT is in its 17th year of business. Their services include conceptual planning, design development, regulatory compliance, watershed and stormwater management, and design build construction and operations phase services. R2T is a certified small disadvantaged business with the U.S. Small Business Administration and is a certified women's business enterprise by the Women's Business Enterprise National Council. In 2018, Kim was awarded the Ladies Achieving Continuous Excellence or LACE Trailblazer Award by the Greater Women's Business Council, which is awarded in recognition of certified women business enterprise owners who are pillars in their communities, contributing their time and talent to mentoring, partnerships, volunteerism, and supporting other women business enterprises. Also, most recently in 2022, Kim received the 100 Most Influential Women in Engineering Award in the state of Georgia. Yeah, it's a very impressive. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, so I can attest um, based on all of the things I just read in Kim's bio, that she truly is mentoring and volunteering and supporting um, women in her space. And I was so grateful to um, work under Kim in 2012. So this was the time between my master's and starting the PhD program. And I've mentioned my three jobs several times on this platform. And this was one of my, my positions. And just as a mentor and a supervisor, it was such a chill experience. I had so much fun going out into the field and I'm still pretty good friends with the co my colleagues at R2T. And so, um, y'all, this is just a testament that, you know, people along your way can really influence your journey and whether they know it or not, <laughs> you know, it's that they're really helpful with getting us through this somewhat arduous STEM journey. Well, I appreciate it. And it was great having you, Sunny. Um, you know, even after you, you finished your internship, we definitely kept in touch and I've been watching all the great things you're doing. So again, I am proud uh, of all the work. And for you, I think this is a great idea having um, such a platform to give people a place to go to. So kudos to you. Yeah, thank you. Once again, the same support that I've received over the last 10 years. Thank you so much. And we'll jump right in. Okay. Um, I'm pretty sure everyone's excited to hear about your background and how you got into the, to the business and earning, owning your own firm. So my first question is, what motivated you to study chemistry and environmental health um, in your undergraduate and graduate studies? Um, so um, as far as chemistry, I went to uh, Rutgers University um, and I actually started Rutgers, you know, not in chemistry, um, more in pharmacy and um, liking some of those classes, but not so much, um, not most of them. Um, and, but I always loved chemistry. And so um, I've changed, changed my major, um, pursued a degree in chemistry, um, began working soon after a bachelor's degree of first doing ovarian cancer research, which was um, uh, nothing that I thought I would be, but there was an opportunity. So I did that. And then 
moving over to work in um, a company that provided um, chemistry, but it was more on the laboratory services for water and wastewater uh, treatment. And that's kind of where I began my water journey. Um, that, that position led me to um, apply to Temple University because I was working in the Philadelphia area and um, I pursued my master's there. So it wasn't a, you know, I graduated high school and I knew I would be a chemist doing water treatment. It's kind of a journey that I took. So that's where I am now. Been doing that for over 30 years um, and all facets of water. So I did total water management. That's awesome. I did not know about your ovarian cancer research <laughs> and the pharmacy studies. So yeah. that's pretty interesting. Um, and so we talked about how you got there and how you got into water by doing an internship, you said? Um, it's actually a position. Um, it's a position. I had a full-time position. I didn't have, uh, you know, I was broke and I had student loans when I graduated undergrad. So I needed to go to work. And that job was um, working for a company that provided polymers um, for water and wastewater treatment. So that's really how I got in the business. And I went to places, um, you know, across the United States cleaning uh, particularly wastewater wow yeah. yeah so the the financial strain is the impetus most times exactly us. exactly yeah okay and so you you started to talk about this um and this relates to my next question can you describe more about your roles in your positions in industry such as your role at the plant and take us through your decision to start your own farm Okay, so let's start with that position. Um, I was what they call an applications chemist. And so that was a chemist who went, who received water samples initially and, and went in the lab and tried to clean them, you know, to meet regulatory, you know, mandates. Um, and so, um, you know, it was all different types of applications that uh, wastewater treatment applications were applied to a lot of these samples. And then you would go out and do a full scale or a pilot scale evaluation to see if you can duplicate the laboratory results. Um, and so after doing that, I um, and receiving my master's degree, I pursued another position and this time it was on the clean water side. So the first job was wastewater working at, you know, Chrysler, water, um, Chrysler and Ford and Levi's and all those that produced waste, right? And so now this position was you know, taking water from a stream and making it drink, you know, drinking water. And so this, this position was similar, is similar technology, but now um, um, cleaning uh, surface water uh, to make it drinking water. Um, and so that was my position um, as a scientist at American Water Works, um, American Water Works Service Company. And, um, sorry, American Water Service Company, American Water Works, that's an organization. Um, and so I did that for some time, um, you know, life happens and you get married and your husband has a job, but you have to move away from that position. And then that's when I went into the consulting world and worked there um, for some time, about seven years. And um, my husband was also in the business. Um, and um, so we kind of worked in the same field. And it was uh, after having my son, where I realized that, you know, th this level of work thinking, I was thinking, I was wrong, but I was thinking that, um, you know, kind of doing your own business would give you more time with, you know, your child and, you know, being more present for them. Well, you know, actually found out that when you own your own company, you work twice as hard. So, um, yeah, so baptism by fire, I learned on the job. <laughs> I learned the hard way, but but there were some benefits to it because now if I needed to be somewhere with my son, I could. I would just have to work, you know, after hours to get that done. So it gave me some more flexibility. So that's kind of how my path went. I never started off being an entrepreneur. I was not raised that way. It was raised that you get a job and you work in that job and you know you work until you know until you retire. Um, so um, we we weren't taught that entrepreneurship was. Uh, um, an option. So. Wow, wow, wow. Okay. So, but you're so successful. So there's no formal training yeah. that you went through um, yeah. beyond your chemistry and environmental health degree. Um, so can you kind of talk about whether or not 
formal training or if someone's starting out, would you recommend that they go through some formal training or get an MBA to get on the entrepreneurship track? What, what I would recommend. I know now people graduated, like I'm going to start my business in my industry in my, for my career that I would have not done well if I did that. Okay. So I worked in the business, I, you know, probably by the time we started our business, I was, you know, 12, close to 15 years worth of experience. You know, so I had made relationships. I knew, I knew the discipline very well. I knew who the players were. Um, so I, you know, you know, sometimes, you know, it's, you can get the degree, but you also have to do the non, um, academic things as well. And those are mainly relationships. So would I recommend um, a business degree? Um, that would not hurt. I did not choose the avenue. But if you're not able to get a business degree, I would definitely recommend some type of um, training um, in things like human resources, which is you know, the biggest, the biggest for me, it's the biggest um, um, area that I had to learn, you know, um, it's a lot of regulatory requirements um, surrounded human resources. Um, also, accounting is key. Um, and then I would say that you really have to have um, um, some type of experiences just uh, interacting with people, relationship building, um, marketing, um, development, business development, those kind of things. And so you know, just saying I graduated with this degree, let me go out and start a company. I mean, some folks could probably do that. I'm an introvert. And so that I, that would not um, work for me. And my relationships are more uh, organic. Oh, wow. That's, um, that's really interesting and helpful to hear that, okay, you started your firm on a foundation of 10 plus years of relationships. Mm -hmm. So that's important to know. And so you talked about human resources, accounting, business development, and all I hear is cash going out the door. <laughs> so can you talk about the costs that are associated or that were associated with starting this business and getting all those systems up and running? And did you need outside support in the form of a business loan? Yeah. So I would say uh, cash. So, you know, now we are consultants, so we sell hours. And so we're not selling widgets or items. We sell hours and our hours is our hours from our brain, right? So did I require a lot of upfront money to do, to start the business? I did not. I did not because I was um, having relation, had relationships, um, got contracts through those relationships and was working. I was the seller doer so not only was I selling the company um, but I was also doing the work and so it was a computer and Kim producing the deliverables that the client needed um, I will say that um, having cash is helpful you know computers we worked out of the home at that time um, and um, we did get a loan a small loan okay so okay you can have business degrees but what is most important you have to have good credit, right? You have to have good credit to go to a bank, new company going to a bank saying, hey, I want, I, I need a loan for X amount of dollars. Well, first thing they're going to do is, you know, pull your, your credit. It's not the company has no credit, hasn't built anything yet. So they're going to pull your credit and say, uh, yes, we can give you X amount of dollars to help you start. You know, it's, it's a personal loan, basically. It wasn't a business loan. Um, and it was $10,000, you know, and it helped, you know, buy computers and maybe some supplies and just keep, you know, keep things moving. But um, yeah, I would say if you go into a bank and ask for some type of loan for a new business without any, um, you know, credit for the company, you're going to be the insurer. And so they're going to pull your credit. If you don't have the credit, then that may be an obstacle. So, so you can have all the degrees you want, but if you don't have good credit, yeah, it's probably going to be a struggle for you to get new loans. So they're not necessary, but we also had some savings. Um, so we used our savings to start the company, but we also did get a business loan to start building credit um, for the business. That's, that's really interesting. And this is kind of an impromptu follow-up. 
how would one begin to build credit for the company? Like, how do you go from using your own personal finances to the company being a standalone business in a form like a, of a tax ID or something like that? Yeah. So the first thing you would do, I mean, and that's required, I think, in most states is to get a, um, a tax ID. Um, and with that tax ID, um, you go to a bank and open a bank account. Um, you know, start for having a relationship with that bank. Um, get a credit card in the name of a company if, you, if you're able to. Um, getting a credit card, using that bank to pay vendors. So they're seeing activity, they're seeing, you know, um, that you're, you know, if someone is, if a client is paying you, you're using their bank, they're seeing flow of money. Um, and I think that that's what was helpful for us, forming a relationship. It could be a credit union, it could be a small bank, it could be, you know, Wells Fargo, Bank of America, those big banks. Um, so, you know, I would definitely recommend you do that. Okay, thank you for that advice. And for those listeners that are looking to talk about like LLCs, we're not going to talk about that today. You know, we're not going to talk about the incorporation of it. Well, maybe we will, but um, maybe that'll come a little bit later. But thank you for that conversation about the financial part of it mm -hmm. or just starting up. Yeah, start up. Yeah. And um, talk, discussing startup, I do want to ask you, if you can go back to the early 2000s when you're going through this startup process, what would you tell Kim then to make the process a little bit easier? What kind of advice would you give yourself? Yeah, I probably, I mean, in, in reality, I probably would say take an accounting class, you know, that um, because, you know, we hired an accountant and she's great and we still use her and she's awesome. But getting to understand like, you know, your quarterly reports, your profit and loss statements, your balance sheet. For someone like me who studied chemistry and environmental health, that is foreign language. That's a foreign language. Um, what does that mean? So there's one thing of getting those reports, but in, another thing as um, to look at how, what, what they say about the health, your financial, the, the financial health of the company. What do they say? Where is it trending? What things do you need to change? And then start developing what you call a budget for each year so that if you see that you're spending X amount of dollars in supplies and maybe you know your budget for the following year is like, okay, maybe we don't get computers next year. So that you begin to have like a, a um, it's kind of like a guideline on the financial operations of the company. So, um, I would say, I would tell myself, you know, that was all foreign to me. And I did not know that um, going in and learn that this process through um, just being a business owner and, and realizing how important it is. That's interesting. And that sounds very much like running a research lab <laughs> um, where we're technically trained in STEM foundations, but managing the grants and the startups and looking at those uh, expenditures and procurement reports. I, it, it sounds very much mm -hmm. the same, but maybe it's lower risk for academics because we've got obviously support to tell us when we've overdrawn our accounts <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and they've already set up vendor relationships. And so. Yeah. It like, does. I mean, yeah. I can imagine that you have your own, you know, you have your laboratory, you have your students. So it, it must be similar, like this is my little company in a way. And I actually um, spoke with, I don't know, you probably have Dr. Huang from Tech, um, who, who talks a lot about, um, who talks a lot about, it's kind of like you're a business owner, you know, going to get the project, going to get the funding, um, and then managing that once you do have it. So I get it. Yeah, that's awesome. Except we don't have to manage that overhead stuff. Yeah. We have help. We have help. That's good. Um, this is a really good conversation and I want to transition from talking about how to get started to managing operations. Mm -hmm. I'm gathering those are different beasts. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, my first question is, can you please describe your day-to-day -day role as president and partner? What's your life like? 
running this company. Yeah, I laugh because there's no like real routine to that. So um, I will say I am, oops, I am the owner, uh, you know, president of R2T. So I manage, you know, do those things, right? And so that's, you know, handle payroll, um, look at insurances, look at, you know, um, development and training of employees, uh, benefits, you know, doing all that. But I also do technical work. And so I review all deliverables before they're sent to the client and do contracting on different projects and change orders or, you know, address any issues. Um, so, so there's that bucket. And then there's also the bucket of marketing and that's going to meet clients and um, attending conferences and, you know, um, just forming new relationships and targeting areas we should work in strategic planning and who is a strategic hire and who's a strategic client and where should we be working? So um, when, when the question is, how do I manage operations? I will say um, um, it's not a, there's not a routine. I do have an office manager um, who kind of helps. So right now we're about 60 folks. So I have like an office manager um, who helps um, with some of the day-to-day, -day, like, you know, accounts payable and, um, you know, um, enrolling in 401k and, you know, all, all those kind of um, HR related things. We do, again, I said we have accounting that we have outsourced, so that helps. And then there's the operations on um, how successful are your projects financially. So we do have meetings on those. And then we have how are they performing? Um, what is What would the client say? And, and so there's some of that internal workings on, on on things like that. So it's um it's a mixed bag when you're a small business owner. Um, so if I was an owner of, you know, president of Coca-Cola, my role might be different. It might be more um root, not routine, but maybe a little more routine because I as a small business don't have a lot of overhead cash. So I have to perform a lot of the duties that maybe other organizations might have people to fill those roles. So it's, it's, you know, it's a balance, I would say. Wow, that's a lot of work. Yeah. It's a lot of work. And I'm just going to be honest, you made it look easy. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't have a, like a concept of what you were doing. I knew you were running the company, but that's a lot of hats to wear and a lot of plates to juggle at one time yeah well I also have my partner George who who, who, who does a lot of the the technical uh, work but he's also involved in some of the the operation side but it's a lot of work so um, I like to be frank with people it's rewarding and it pays off um, but it's a lot of work and for me um, where I was in my career I think think that it was a good change for me because what else was I going to do but do the same thing I was doing and I worked for a company that I saw no no room for advancement for me I mean there are some for others but not for me um, so this was a good change it kind of um, took me out of the comfort the box of comfort where you know you just do this every day you do this every day to now again an introvert who now has to go out and meet and get work from folks that's, you know, it's, um, it, it was a good change for me. So I can say that it's been challenging, especially COVID, um, during this COVID era, it's been really challenging, especially since the market on getting, um, you know, good staff um, has become tight. Um, you know, those are the things that small businesses really have to compete with larger firms for. So it can be challenging. Yeah, thank you for bringing that up. Um... Also, it's it's interesting to hear you say how you've had to come out of your comfort zone and do things that aren't maybe natural or just naturally comfortable. But I just want to take this moment to encourage someone that's listening that even though you think your personality may not be set up for something, that's never a deterrent. You can show up as you are and still be successful as demonstrated by Kim. And, and you can always grow, 
into what is needed in that position. So I think that, you know, our personalities are what they are, but, you know, you know, we're complex people. So if we have to turn on the switch, we can turn on the switch. <laughs> yep, the code switch. Definitely. There we go. <laughs> so, yeah, thank you for um, giving us kind of a inside view of what it takes to like run a run your firm day to day. And now I want to ask you specifically about the firm's designation as a small disadvantaged business. Yeah. Um, so can you tell us what the requirements are for that in Georgia and yeah, how you got that designation? Yeah, so the disadvantaged business enterprise is the designation that I have. And it's, um, you know, um, I received the certification by Georgia Department of Transportation, but it is, it is under an umbrella of the unified group. I can't remember. It's a federal code. And so most states have this similar um, requirement. So there, in order to be a disadvantaged business enterprise and get certified as one, um, you know, it's either minority or women owned firms um, greater than I think 50% ownership um, of a qualifying person. And the qualifying person would be, you know, African-American, Hispanic, uh, uh, women owned, women and other uh, minority groups. Um, so, so that's, that's one thing. There's also a net worth limit. So um, if you have a net worth of like 5 million, you're probably not, and, and you're probably not, <laughs> not going to be certified as a disadvantaged business enterprise. And I can't recall what the limit is, but I think it's like 1.1, 1, 1 and a quarter million, your net worth. Um, and it doesn't include your home. I'm getting really down in the weeds now, but um, so there's a net worth limit that you have to um, be under in order to be a disadvantaged business enterprise. Um, and I, you have to fill out a boatload of paperwork, you know, justifying, you know, who you are, or yeah, justifying who you are, your company, and just regular information that they can track you. And to stay certified, it's an annual reporting um, of any changes there may be in your company and ownership and any changes in your network. So that's kind of how that is. So that's disadvantaged business enterprise. There's also the Women Business Enterprise Council um, that um, will certify you as a women-owned firm. Um, that's a national organization as well. Um, and then local municipalities and states and cities have their own local or women or minority um, own enterprise. So wherever you are, you know, just look up, you know, these type of programs. They are useful. They are, um, they don't secure you work, but they can get you in, in the room. And that's the key is getting in the room. You have to perform once you're there, but you can get in the room. Yeah, excellent advice. Um, getting in the room and then doing the work when you get there. And just to clarify, your home does not count toward that it does not. So it's your net worth outside of your primary residence. But if you have um, rental properties, other uh, properties you own, they do count. So. Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> so um, that's great advice there. And it, along the same line of questioning, in terms of being a small disadvantaged business enterprise, what are the most important aspects of keeping the business a success? Um, is it the talent? Is it the staff? Is it client relationships? And is it the actual contracts? So can you talk to us about like best practices for keeping the business successful? So, so I would say that all those you just listed are, are very important. Um, I would say that you, the key is finding and keeping good people. Um, because you're only as good as your last contract. And if you have performed poorly on the contract, um, depending on um, what, uh, what it was, it could really harm you. So um, people, you know, people are like, you need to run your company, not being your company. And the issue I have with that is because I, uh, you know, as an owner, regardless of the, if the project's a success or not, will own it, right? So that's, that's, I have to live with that. And so my goal is then to make sure that our projects are successful. 
um, and the client is happy. It's the Chick-fil-A approach, you know, my pleasure to help you. Um, that's, that's my goal always. So, um, so, so having good people who have great work ethic, ethic and, and understand um, the importance of client relationship and um, performing, that, that, that's very important. Um, and so the contracts are important as well. Um, having good clients who pay well so that you have cash flow to, <laughs> to have payroll uh, is also a, an important um, um, uh, factor. Some of the clients then, you know, they pay slower. We work for federal, state, and local agencies. And so they aren't always like, the, you know, pay the quickest, although the federal government now is paying a lot quicker within two weeks. So that's nice. But, you know, having clients that understand the small business, who embrace small businesses will understand getting these small businesses paid um, is really important. So, um, not all clients are good clients. And I would say if you have to spend $10,000 to get a $5,000 contract, that's, you know, you really have to evaluate, is it, is it worth it? And so, um, you know, those are things to, to balance. <laughs> um, yeah, so, so it's all those things, you know, having good staff, having good clients, um, and having a strategy and a vision for your staff. I think that's Excellent. That's excellent advice. Um, spending 10K for 5K. Yeah. Um, that's an example that I think just is pretty applicable across the board. Like I take the same thought process when it comes to applying for grants. Oh, yeah. I look at the funding amount and then how much time commitment it takes. And I'm going to shout out professor rob harley who has this like quotient that he calculates about it's based on the page numbers that you have to write for the grant how much money it is how much time it's going to take and then if it doesn't meet the quotient threshold he's not touching it it's a no-go <laughs> yeah right right um yeah i and I, i'm kind of taking that same uh approach and so that was good that's smart that's smart yeah, that's working cool. smart you can work hard, but you can, you know, it's better to work smart. It is better to work smart. And you touched on vision. You talked about vision just now. And so I'd like to probe that a little bit more. Does the scope and scale of R2T as it exists today, does that reflect your original vision for the company? Um, so, so I would say no. <laughs> I would say no. So, you know, our intent when we started the company was to be a small business. We are still a small business, but you know, 20, 25, 30 folks was kind of our vision. And what, what came was, you know, a, a need for, to expand based on, um, you know, where the work has taken us. And so initially, you know, as you know, when we, when we did stream evaluation and monitoring, and then we also did design um, of, of systems, but then we had a, um, a client, which is the National Park Service, who wanted us as, you know, to help them, but they wanted their projects to be designed and built. So not only just designing systems, but um, building them. And that's how they were contracting. And, and this was after the, the bust of, you know, 2008. So that was their new approach now, design, build, because they had some funding it was funding from the government that required that. And so we developed more of the construction arm, self-performing, not just managing construction, but actually self-performing construction. Never intended to do that initially, but that's where the work took us. Um, and so we continue to develop on that. And now we have um, a significant construction arm of the company. Um, so um, that wasn't in our vision, um, but it is now. One of the other areas that we've developed was what we call um, VDC, visualization, um, design, construction. And that's visual drone flying, laser scanning of facilities. That is key now. Why are we doing this? Because that supports our construction arm, but it is also kind of a bridge between a design that, um, say, a facility needs upgrading. 
and we don't have the as built or the drawings um, available because it's uh, it was built in 1920 or 19, you know, early years. We do the scanner who can get the smallest um, measurements for the facility and we can develop plans based on that. And that's a real trend um, and a service that we're happy to provide now. Um, you know, the federal government uses that in some of the old water treatment plants. And so we've been able to capitalize on that skill. So what I'm hearing is that you are fluid and flexible with the work and how the field evolves. And yep. just as an impromptu a follow up question, have you seen instances where companies don't evolve with the times and how that ultimately hurts or helps them? Yeah, I, I mean, I think if you, if you are in, in this field and you don't do civil 3D in 3D now, if you're not using Revit or if you're not using BIM models, then you're kind of, out, you know, you're kind of placing yourself out of the market because that is the trend and that's the competition. And so you have to develop those skills. Um, and like by the same token, some of the water quality monitoring that is done, I think, you know, over the years that has started to become a commodity. So then we have to think about, you know, is this a service that you know, we can continue to provide with people who are looking for increases in pay, increases in responsibility, but the client is saying, I'm only gonna pay you $5, you know, that I was paying you 10 years ago. And so there's like, there's, there's some evaluation of all of the services um, that goes on, you know, annually um, and, and we're tweaking and, you know, the industry is driving um, at most of the, um, the new approaches to design. And it's um, also telling us where we need to be a player and not. So even if we were in the past, so. Okay, that's, that's great. I have one more follow-up question in that regard. Uh -huh. So if there is new technology being derived in, in the space, are you hiring someone that already knows how to do it or do you send someone to get the training? We do both. We do both. In, in, in the case of the, the laser scanning, we hired someone who was a strategic hire who then trained folks that we have. Um, and, and, you know, people want to learn new things. And so, um, yeah, we, we had to hire someone. Um, we had to have different equipment, you know, and wasn't cheap, but we made an investment because this is what, you know, we, this is where we needed to be. Um, and then we, you know, train folks to learn um, and that's done well. Well, congratulations on um, the scale of the company to this day. Um, I, it's an awesome company to work for. And I'm going to link uh, all of the, or just the website to in the description box in case people want to learn more about the technical great. side. That'd be great. Uh, yeah, because we didn't get into the actual projects because I want people to understand kind of the, the meta part of what you do. Mm -hmm. awesome. And okay. Awesome. <laughs> it's, yeah, I appreciate it. Yeah. And speaking of meta, <laughs> Uh -oh. <laughs> I want to get into what I call the under the hood part of the interview where we talk about the sticky part of what you do. Okay. Um, you mentioned a partner, you mentioned that you have a child. A, a, who's an adult now? <laughs> yeah, <he's> an adult. <laughs> <laughs> so um my question is uh for those of us that you know are trying to balance work and life what were your best practices and strategies for balancing the demands of the company and your family? And do you think that the demands are different now for people that are on this path based yeah. on the political climate? The word demands is always being on, right? That That's a demand and, you know, client calls you need it. Employee needs something, you're on. You know, you take vacation, you're always plugged in. Like you are always plugged. You can be halfway around the world and you're plugged in, right? Um, so, so those are, you know, some of the things that, um, you know, it's just the way it is. It's just, it's just as a business owner, this is you. Nobody else is going to really carry that load. So you have to be on. Um, as far as, you know, again, the plus side is that there is flexibility when 
you need to you need it to be at school and you know a kid is having this great performance and you don't want to miss out on it you can kind of work that around work around that um so i would say during COVID now i mean so there's life before COVID, and there's approaches to managing the company before COVID and all and balancing post COVID, it's maybe a little easier in some respect okay so first first i'll say in some respect so that you know, you always were in, you know, I live in Atlanta, right? So you're, you have to run there, run there, you're in traffic. So if you have a meeting, you know, maybe you can only schedule two a day because, you know, it takes forever just to go 10 miles, 10 miles down to downtown or something like that. Um, where now you have the virtual option always um, a meeting. So it allows you to build more into your day um, that way. Um, so to me, I feel that if business owners um, have more avenues to get at their clients. So, I mean, you can, I mean, you can get, depending on services, you can get your clients through Instagram, you know, you can do Zoom or Teams and, you know, all these things depend. If you're selling goods, that's your thing that, you know, you know, you're probably on Facebook market and Google market and all these other platforms to, to do that. So. I think in some respect it is easier or not necessarily easier. It's just different ways to, to touch your client. Um, bad thing about that is that you're relying on that as well. And there, it makes it a lot easier to work all day, right? Because if you can work from home and build every hour <laughs> scheduled with something, you can work all day where Previously, you know, you left work six or seven, maybe you did something at home, but there was a difference in office and home. Now office is home and the days are one. Um, and to me, I think that's a downfall. And even during COVID, I had to go to the office because there, initially there were days that you just don't know what's going to happen, what's going on in this world, if you never shut the computer off. Um, and that can lead to a lot of issues. So, um, so I don't know if I answered the question, but um, it's different to, it's different. You have different ways to reach your client now. So I think that's a plus, but at the down, on the downside, I think um, the work can become overwhelming and uh, completely occupying all your time. Okay. So how are you managing or balancing or is just, yeah. Yeah. So one of the things, like I said, I do is I, I do go to the office. Um, me for my sanity because you can get so wrapped up in it that um, the quality of life is not good so there is a cutoff time for that um like i like i said that's important so there um you know i try initially when COVID started you know you get these invites to meetings so every hour on the hour was filled with meetings and there was no time for you to even grab lunch because they, there was like oh, this webinar is over lunch, you need to be here on how to manage um, uh, employees during COVID. So you wanted to be there and, and hear what others are doing. Um, so um, now I just, you have to find time during the day. So there is like, I block out time um, on my calendar that I won't take any calls. And mainly I try to catch up or just be or go for a walk or go grab a bite now that, you know can get out and do stuff so um i think it, it just has to be really intentional um that you find time to um take a break from work um hit dogs will holler and i'm hollering um <laughs> <laughs> yeah that resonates with me yeah you so can work, work all day yes <laughs> uh, Okay, <laughs> but I, uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm also trying to be intentional about, okay, this is what you're working on during this period, and this is your intentional rest period. Yeah, make, make the list, like I live by list. I live by my calendar. Somebody put something on my calendar without me knowing it, I'm like, delete, I'm not coming. <laughs> I mean, this, you have to clear it first because, you know, I, I'm really trying to make things more, um, you know, organized so you can be present when you are and not worry about oh I have this next meeting that I need to prepare for so I'm really 
I'm really, my videos often on for parents. So I'm not listening to what you're saying. You know what I mean? So um, yeah, it's a bad, you have to balance it. Oh man, that's another video. Like <laughs> this new virtual world. Yeah. Um, and so thank you for sharing that and telling us about being intentional about your time. And I could say, yeah, I, I did notice that you did that even in the book four times. <laughs> <laughs> and then my next question is related to your identity as a Black woman. Mm -hmm. um, so can you tell us about any challenges that you face and how you overcome those as a result of your identity? Um, as far as the business in general? Yeah, as far as business. Being, I'm loaded. Um, I mean, business. loaded. I'm old, so I got a lot of issues. <laughs> um, you well, know, it's specific to the business. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um. So I would say, in um, you know, so so I'm a disadvantaged business enterprise. Yay for me gets me in the room, but a lot of times, you know, others but see that's like a mark. You know, almost oh, you're DBE or you're minority firm or um you know you're you have that designation as in we're here and you're here so i'm not sure if it's me being a african-american woman or what the issues are but there is a there there is some um perception um that maybe um look we all come from these large firms where we do work we do a good job we perform well so being small and disadvantaged does not mean you're less than um, and so, so there's some of that and there's some of also um, the set asides or the small business set asides and I think that as an African American, um, and I'm not sure who the audience is here but as an African American, um, you're not always perceived as one who will go into a technical or STEM career and do well by folks. And so, um, you know, even when there's a disadvantaged business enterprise um, set aside, you are trying to jump through hoops for people to see you as credible, as viable, as successful um, with this face and skin. And, you know, so, um, and that is a challenge in, in, in the STEM field. Um, so, and I'll leave it there. I'll do a follow-up. Thank you for the candid advice. So even trying to do what we're doing with our faces, how do you just move past it and move on and keep persevering? What, what's driving you internally and what's your mantra? What are you telling yourself to keep you showing up in these places that may be looking at you funny? So I will say having... Uh... Well, you're you're a good example you know you see you see the the people that come through your company the people that you've touched in some way doing well um and and you know hopes that you know over time some of this will be it'll be normal to see people like us playing in in stem right um and so um it's encouraging i'm encouraged by uh, those who um have sought careers in STEM and are successful. Um, I have other students who, who have gone on and um, got master's degrees at some you know, pretty prestigious schools and are doing well. And so I would say that you know, that's the real, um, you know, if, if, you, if you just walk away, then you'll never be a player. You'll never be impactful. You'll never, you'll never leave anything. Um, for others to pick up and run with. And so that, that really, because there are times, you know, you say, um, yeah, what, what am I doing this for? Because how many times can you be told, you know, no, but, you know, you have, you have to keep going. And then there are some, there are a lot of folks who are supportive of these programs and, and for people like me, it's just finding them and um, with hopes that, you know, that, you know, that's why it's important for, for, for my folks to do a good job because I can't give free to any of the you know, negative about small business and disadvantaged businesses. So. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. Thank you, it is tough. Yeah. And um, you're, you're, you're kind of rounding out the conversation in terms of encouraging people to keep showing up, showing mm -hmm. us that 
we just have to stay in the space because eventually things will get different. Mm -hmm. And so with that being said, do you have any final words of advice for minorities, LGBT women who are looking to start their technical firms and um, how would they best cultivate success today in 2022? Yeah, I would say, um, you know, there, there's support for um, organizations like mine. Um, they have, um, you know, the, the Minority Business Council is a great organization, it's national organizations in every state. If you really want to start a business, other than have good credit, um, um, seek the seek the support, seek the support of you know the um, the uh, uh, procurement advisory um, councils like Georgia Tech has one. Most universities, Georgia State here, they have those, and so they're willing to help you. I would say um, you know there are organizations for support, and I would use those organizations as much as possible. There are resources, federal dollars are going towards um, these organizations and programs to help not only minorities, but all, all firms, women, and um, all, you know, all small firms. So I would say use those as much as possible. They are key and they have an insight to how to win work and how to perform and how to keep your accounting books and how to you know do all those things that make you uh, successful. So that's my my use all the resources you can you know and 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 keep good relationships. Uh, you know even if it's not the best relationship or best experience you have, always maintain relationships because someone can become your boss any day. And that's true. <laughs> That's right. I have a TikTok that says you never know where people are going to end up. So be careful. Be <laughs> careful what you say. That's right. Exactly. Yep. That's true. Well, and be careful what you do. And, you know, and in this space um, for um, STEAM and STEM folks, I would say, you know, professionalism as early on, you know, we're in college, we cut up some, but, you know, um, it, it, especially with with social media you know be very careful and just remember that you know nothing is gone nothing is gone and uh with that I just want to say thank you for talking with the under the hood community about how you run your business how you got started best practices and I'm, I'm hoping that this conversation can be impactful for, yeah. for our listeners. Yeah, if anyone has any additional questions or wants to know more, you know, I can drill down and talk about this as much, you know, as, as, as needed. So feel free to reach out. And thanks for Absolutely. having me. Danny, it's great seeing you. And I'm, again, proud of all that you're doing. So. Thank you, Kim. Thank you, Kim. And this has been episode 11 of Under the Hood, and we'll see you in the next one.